the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and, place, and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them to stay. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the God shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring your good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of, the, of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared the angel, with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and had gone to heaven, the shepherds said to another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see, and see this saying that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was, who was lying in the manger when <coughs> they had seen him. They separated the word considering that considering what had been told that told them about this child and all who heard it were it were amazed by what the shepherd said to them but mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which they were just as they had been told. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east, who, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judea are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent to them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. As you heard in that story, when the announcement was made, when people heard that the Messiah, the long-expected uh, gift from God was given, they came to worship. They came to bow down. They came to bring gifts in thanks for this great gift that was given. A part of our act of worship is giving thanks and giving gifts back to the Lord. And so we're going to take an offering at this time. If you've come this morning and haven't come prepared to give, please don't feel you know, obligated to do so. But if you feel so moved, 
and want to express your thanks in that way, that offering plate will be passed and you can make your contributions which go to the ministry of our church. Christmas is all about gifts, the gifts that God desires to give to each one of us. The blessings from heaven. In James 1 verse 17 it says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father in heaven. God's greatest gift to us is love. First John 4, uh, verse 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. of his word. His words are contained in the Bible. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. John 6, verse 63. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Son Jesus coming to die for our sins was God's most precious gift. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life.
Jimmy Grace. Romans 5, verse 15. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Ephesians 2, verse 8. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Romans 8, verse 12. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you, has, says, <laughs> has set you free from the law of sin and death. Galatians 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Romans 8, verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to, to fear again, but you have received a gift of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. <laughs> means the gift of being saved means the gift of protection. First John 5 verse 18. He who was born of God keeps him. The evil one does not touch him. Romans 11 verse 29. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is de death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ.
The gift of being saved means the gift of peace in your hearts. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. the gift of hearing that soul. First Peter 2, 20, verse 24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we are healed. the gift of joy-filled living. Romans 5, verse 17. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? John 15, verse 11. I have told you this so that you may joy, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I give our most gracious Lord, I come with empty hands. All that I have is what God provides me, and all I can give is my heart willingness to obey. Corinthians 8, verse 12. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have.
most gracious Lord, I come with empty hands. All I have is what God provides me. All I can give is my thankful praises. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. God offers all these gifts to uh, all the people. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. May your Christmas this year be rich with God's gifts and blessings. And may we remember to share everything that our Lord ha God has forgiven to us. Thank you so much. Can we give the boys and girls a big applause? Excellent. Thank you. Christmas. Gift giving. It all goes hand in hand, doesn't it? In fact, when surveys are uh, done and uh, asking the uh, average American about, uh, you know, how much do you expect to spend uh, this year on Christmas gifts, uh, the average person is saying between eight and nine hundred dollars. Wow. But you know, when you start adding up all the people in your life and, and the different parties that you have to go to and, and so forth, it still seems like an awful amount, but uh, wow, that's a lot of gift giving. In fact, nationally, they say that we spend between 400 and 500 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars on Christmas. That's incredible. That's incredible. But with all this gift giving that goes on, I'd like to ask you the question, what did you get for Christmas last year? Hmm. Uh, was it that, so you know, a socks or tie or sweater or, uh, you know, I know it was, no, that was the year before. You know, in all of the gift giving, I say, what? really was the impact that it has. Now, we know that it's really not about the gift. It's about the giver. But when we think about all the gifts that were given for Christmas, I wonder, what was the very first Christmas gift? Anybody know what the very first Christmas gift ever given was? You know, baby Jesus, you are exactly right. A baby, a baby was given. That's right, that's right. A baby was given as the first Christmas gift. You see, God looked at our world, a world that he had created beautiful, magnificent. I mean, some of the sunsets w that we've had recently, or sunrises, or, or if you've gone traveling and, and you've seen, you know, uh, the great state of Indiana or the other states around, and, and, and you know, maybe even traveled internationally, and you've, you've looked around just, you know, and you said, 
Wow. You know, and then you can turn your, your, your focus even further out into space and, and see stars and galaxies. I mean, this world, the universe, is magnificent. God made it beautiful. And he placed human beings on planet Earth to enjoy the things that he has made but especially to enjoy Him. And the Bible says that God's regular habit was to come down and, and spend time with Adam and Eve, and they just kind of hung out together and had a good time. It was a love relationship that was absolutely perfect. But something happened. God had said, listen, Adam and Eve, we're, we're going to have a little deal here. You can eat from any of the trees in the garden. It's fine. It's there for you. But there's one tree, and this is going to be a sign of your love to me, your, your faithfulness and your obedience. Don't eat from that tree. But Satan comes along and says, eh, you know why God didn't say you know, eat from that tree? It's because if you eat from that tree, you're going to be wise, just like him. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. And, and God wants to, you know, uh, keep this, this great tree from you. And Adam and Eve look at that tree. And you've heard the phrase, the forbidden fruit. This is where it comes from. The forbidden fruit is just like the more you look at it, the more you want it. I say, well, why did God say no? There must be something special about that tree. Let's just, let's just try this, to, just a little bite, you know? Kind of like all those Christmas goodies. I'm just going to have a little bite. Well, one bite turns after another and after another, you know, and they looked at that tree and they just want, they taste that. Oh. But then the Bible says the eyes, their eyes were opened. They realized what they had done. Their relationship to this good, perfect God, this, this wonderful world that they were set in, everything became spoiled with sin. Broken. Damaged. Polluted. And boy, do we see the effects today, don't we? A world of terror and anger and violence and lies and greed and manipulation and it's not just simply out there all those people if I be honest I look inside and it's here too Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of what God desired for us If I were God, I think I would just say, fine, be that way. If that's what you want, separation from me, forget you. But that's not how God responded. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. He gave a baby. He gave his only son. Jesus was born as a human baby in a humble manger in Bethlehem to Joseph and Mary. God gave his very best. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God didn't say, fine, be that way. He set about on a very, very costly rescue mission to bring people back to himself. And he did it because of love. Because of love. God so loved the world, yes, but, but each person in the world. This passage is meant to be taken personally. God so loved me that he gave his one and only son for me, for my sin, 
for my brokenness, for my rebellion. God did it for me. And that was the first Christmas gift that was given. God gave his son. Now, when we think about Christmas, it's, you know, all the Christmas carols and the kids all dressed up and cute presents and, and everything. And, you know, it's all beautiful and, and, and wonderful and special. But when we look at the purpose for which God gave his son, that even in the manger, a dark cloud, a dark shadow was cast over Jesus. And that was the shadow of the cross. You see, Good Friday and Christmas go together. God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son to die, to be crucified, to be punished with the most horrendous form of punishment humankind had ever come up with. Why? Why? Because at the cross, the sins of the whole world were paid for. Everyone's sin. The most horrendous person you can think of and yourself. It doesn't matter. Because like I said earlier, we're all sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And it doesn't matter if in human standards our sin is big time or minor league. It doesn't matter. We're all sinners. We're all guilty. We're all deserving of this separation from God. But Jesus came to bridge the gap, to bring us close, to pay the price for all of that sin. And when you get that connection between Christmas and the cross, then you get how costly that first gift really was. In fact, you could call it the greatest gift ever given. The greatest gift ever given was given to you and to me. But like all gifts, they have to be received. They have to be accepted. A gift like this calls for a response from you and me. And it's not just, oh, that's nice. Thanks. But it's a gift that goes, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you for loving me so much that I can be brought close to you again. Thanks for restoring the broken relationship that is there. The response that is called for is a response of admission that we need it. A turning away from all of that brokenness and a saying, Jesus, come into my life. Come make me whole. I can't do it on my own, but you can do it for me. Jesus, I give my life to you. Maybe a simple way of saying that is this. Jesus gave his life for you so that you can give your life to him. That's what it means to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, accepts, receives, gives their life to God and saying, I belong to you. And that's what the children were portraying there at the end. We come with empty hands. We don't have anything to bring. But what we can bring is ourselves, our thanks, our praise to you. And you know what? 
That's the greatest gift that we can give to Jesus. So Christmas is all about gift giving, yes. But it all goes back to that original gift. And how do we respond to it? What you going to do? Are you ready to give Jesus the greatest gift that you could give? The gift of your life, the gift of your trust and your faith in saying, Jesus, I now live for you. Let me pray with you, please. Jesus, we, we, we look at this story and perhaps we've heard it a thousand times. And we look at Christmas and we give a thousand gifts. But this morning we're focused and we're concentrated on that very first gift that you gave. The greatest gift ever given. And we recognize it calls for a response from us to give the greatest gift that we could ever give. Our very hearts. And so Lord Jesus, today, right here, right now, we say, I believe, and I receive, and I give my life to you. Thank you. Thank you for this marvelous gift. In your name we pray. Amen.